Okay, yeah. Thank you very much, Gayatri. So we are now leaving the realm of, of prosecution, be it patents or SPCs, and we're going into the uh, big topic of enforcement and infringement of uh, protected rights. And the reason why I've sort of decided to focus on second medical use claims um, in, in Europe and their enforcement is, is for two reasons, basically. First of all, um, about 70% of the um, patent infringement suits in Europe do take place in Germany. And there have been some recent developments which I thought may be of interest to an Indian audience. Um, and secondly, because um, some of these uh, recent enforcement decisions have been focusing on second medical use claims, I thought this may be of interest to an Indian audience um, which may have some particular interest in, in pharmaceutical matters. So, um, just to sort of remind you, um, what do we mean by second medical use claims? Basically, you encounter two types of claim formats. What I've shown you here is the, uh, on the top is the so-called Swiss type claim format, which is directed at the use of a compound for the manufacture of a medicament for treating a disease. And what is shown on the bottom is the more recent uh, claim format that is used at the EPO, which is the compound for use format. In second medical use claims in Europe, you will find both claim formats with the Swiss type format now sort of slowly petering out because there, have been, there has been a recent decision by the large board of appeal which says that for new patent applications to be drafted, you should no longer rely on the second medical use claim, on, on the Swiss type claim format, but you should use the uh, compound for use format. For those of you who are involved in patent application drafting, our advice to, to clients that are interested on a, on a, on in patent applications on a global level, nevertheless, do think about including the Swiss type claim format still, because there are other jurisdictions like Japan where, where the Swiss type format is still um, available. Um, I'm just showing you this slide because uh, I wanted to sort of preempt a discussion that I do not really want to have. Um, I know that here in India, sometimes when I've been talking about second medical use claims, there is used a long discussion about their sense or their, um, their reason. And I think, um, from my perspective, second medical use patents are a useful tool for any company that is uh, making inventions to somehow protect their investment in terms of what they have invested for clinical trials. At the same time, it is of course also understandable that the public does have an interest in getting access to medicines at a reasonable price. And there has to be, again, a balance struck between these two points. Um, so second medical use claims, I think, are a good tool to regain some investment, but at the same time, they should not be misused as evergreening instruments. And I think with that, I would like to leave that sort of discussion. And I mean, if someone wants to discuss that further, we can do that over coffee afterwards. Um, now, turning to Germany, being a German patent attorney, um, remember, um, infringement of a European patent, although um, the grant of a European patent is uh, stipulated by the European Patent Convention, when it comes to actually determining if there has been an infringement or not, this is dealt with by national law. In other words, if you're sued out of a German national part of a European patent, you'll have to deal with German law. If you're sued out of a UK part of the European patent, you'll have to deal with British law. And I'm now going to focus on um, some German case law. There has been one line of case law, which is the uh, Reiberwirren case law from the District Court of Düsseldorf, which basically dealt with um, this particular claim, which is basically an invention was directed at the use of Reiberwirren, a particular compound in combination with interferon alpha, to treat patients having HCV. The specific thing about all of this was that the patient in the claim was um, the patient in the claim was specified to uh, was specified by a particular physiological status, i.e., was a non-responder to a previous interferon alpha therapy, and it had a certain viral load and it had a certain HCV genotype. So that was the specific thing about this particular patent claim. And that uh, uh, the, the patentee, which was Sharon Plow, they tried to enforce that claim against a um, party, against a company that manufactured and distributed Ribavirin in 200 mg 
capsules. And in their packaging leaflet, they also said that this was to be used for treating HCV in combination with interferon alpha therapy, but they did not include in the packaging leaflet the patient characteristics. So they did not say that the patient was a non-responder to interferon alpha therapy, and they did not specify that the patient had a certain viral load and a certain genotype. The Papati sued this, uh, this party, the, uh, the, this generic company, for direct and indirect infringement, and the district court of Düsseldorf, which is one of the most important infringement courts in Germany, but did not sort of did not find for infringement. And so this record essentially said, in order for there to be an infringement, there must be a form of evident preparation. That is the catchword to take home. In other words, it does not suffice that this ribavirin was suitable to be used in the particular manner that was prescribed in the claim, but there had to be some additional elements present, typically in the packaging leaflet, in the package around the drug, in the advertising material that would make it clear that this drug was to be used for treating HCV for a non-responder, for a non-responder that had a particular genotype and a non-responder um, that had a certain viral load. And so there was no finding of direct infringement and the District Court of Düsseldorf also said there is no indirect infringement because remember the claim was a Swiss type claim so it was use of ribavirin for the manufacture of a medicament and the court found that, of course, this uh, generic manufacturer had manufactured already himself, so he did not offer the drug for someone else to manufacture. So there was no um, indirect infringement either. This concept of evident preparation is a long-standing concept in German uh, case law, and I've just listed here some, some decisions, which I'm not going to go into these, um, but if anyone who's interested in them, um, I think we have some English translations for them, so I could send that to you. Um, the second instance in Düsseldorf, which is the upper district court of Düsseldorf, sort of basically followed this until a couple of years ago. And here I've listed some decisions where, uh, where this the view was basically reinforced. However, so that is sort of the first line of case law that I would like to draw your attention to, and that is something that some of you who are familiar with German infringement proceedings already know. So according to this line of case law, it is perfectly possible to evade infringement of these second medical use claims by carving out, by designing your packaging leaflet, by putting out those indications and those, uh, those uh, this pieces of information which basically are uh, relating to the patent claim. And so remember that example. So there was no indication of the genotype, there was no indication of the physiological status of the uh, patient. Um, and so it was possible by skinny labeling to evade patent infringement. As a result of which, um, the innovative companies often argued and often complained, and in my, in my view, it was uh, some justification that you could, well, you, it was perfectly possible to get second medical use patents in Europe, but you could not really enforce them because a nifty, um, a, a clever um, generic company could easily evade infringement. Three years ago, the whole picture changed. Until then, this was nicely settled case law, but then came the District Court of Hamburg, which is up in the north, and they awarded um, five injunctions for indirect infringement. And in order to understand that of such a second medical use claim, in order to understand that a little bit better, I just would like to sort of um, read once or, or introduce once to you the uh, German stipulation for indirect infringement that basically when you offer means relating to an essential element of the invention, um, and it is obvious, or the third party knows, that these means are suitable and intended to be used. So that is the, the uh, stipulation for indirect infringement. Let me just sort of explain this a little bit further. What happens in Germany if a doctor prescribes a medicine, basically he prescribes it to the patient by the international non-proprietary name, um, and he also, on the prescription leaflet, he will say you can either use the branded product or a generic product, if that is on the market, a cheaper product. Um, the doctor is under a certain budget pressure. He will only get some reimbursement for his treatment if he explicitly provides for this, uh, this prescription to actually provide for 
the uh, substitution to take place. We have public health insurance companies in Germany, and many of these, they offer um, rebate agreements to pharmaceutical um, companies. And these rebate agreements, they are offered by public tenders. If I'm a patient, and then if I go to the pharmacy and show my prescription leaflet that I got from the doctor to the pharmacist, the pharmacist himself will not know the indication that I've been prescribed the, the drug for. And the pharmacist has an obligation to substitute the cheapest drug or to provide me with one of the cheapest drugs that are available that meet the requirements of the prescription leaflet. The pharmacist's software does, again, also does not know what I get, uh, what, what the indication is that I have been uh, prescribed this drug for, and the pharmacist's software points the pharmacist to the cheapest drugs. So, in other words, there is this substitution practice. Um, in, in, in place in Germany, and that is also one thing that I thought when I heard Rowan's talk about data protection, this is a typical example where data protection goes so far that the pharmacist does not know what the patient is really prescribed for, and so um, maybe we can draw a parallel to that. Now, the District Court of Hamburg, this is the claim that was trying to be enforced by Warner Lambert. It's the one of the pregabalin cases, so it's a Swiss-type claim directed at the use of pregabalin for the treatment of pain. And there was a third claim which specified the pain to be neuropathic pain. Pregabalin can not only be prescribed for pain, but it can also be prescribed for general anxiety disorders and for epilepsy. The defendants in this particular case they distributed their um, pregabalin with a, with a label that was restricted to the non-patented indications, i.e. the non-pain uh, indications, so general anxiety disorder and, and epilepsy. And they applied for one of these rebate agreement tenders, which was not limited to these patent-free indications, and they won this tender. So in other words, they were now sort of the prime suppliers for pregabalin, um, in a rebate agreement that was not limited to the patent-free indication. And the court found in those instances, the uh, generic manufacturer actually provided means relating to the essential element of the invention, and it was obvious from the circumstances that this, these means would be suitable and intended for using the invention. So, indirect infringement. So, in other words, the skinny label in that case did not help the, the defendant. Um, yeah, here I've listed two points. Skinny labeling does not prevent from indirect infringement. Um, if you join a, 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 a rebate agreement tender that is without any limitations. And the substitution practice that takes place in Germany is an indication that it is obvious and foreseeable that the pharmacist, the pharmacist will substitute the originator drug. An interesting finding which I want to show you on this one, this concept of evident preparation, which I told you earlier about from the District Court of Düsseldorf, remember the old case law, here the District Court of Hamburg said that a drug is already by its very production an evident preparation or manifest arrangement. That means that no matter what you write on the prescription leaflet, according to the District Court of Hamburg, that is already sufficient to be evidently prepared for the patented purposes. Okay, now, this was the first more recent development. The second one is now, this was indirect infringement, but now the Upper District Court of Düsseldorf has now found quite recently, about one year ago, for direct infringement in the case of um, where also there was a skinny labeled product. And basically the Upper District Court of Düsseldorf made or formulated two requirements. The drug must be suitable for the patented purposes and the defendant takes advantage of circumstances which lead to a patented use. And this um, second requirement is likely to be, to be fulfilled in the case of this cross-label use and uh, in view of the German substitution practice that is, is typically occurring. So, unfortunately that particular decision, the estrogen blocker it's called, does not really provide a lot of guidance for defendants, potential defendants, what, they, what measures they should take in order to 
nevertheless avoid patent infringement. And so here I've listed some possible measures that you might think of if you want to, if you are in the pharmaceutical field and if you want to avoid being sued out of uh, um, a second medical use claim. You should think about changing your advertising material. You should also think about actively informing health insurance companies. You should think about talking to wholesalers and pharmacists. And you should also consider somehow making, uh, bringing the information into the databases of the pharmacies. This is ongoing case law and ongoing discussions. But the take home message is it is also quite likely that you will be sued for direct infringement even if you have the skinny label of your, of your drug. And so as a take home message, liability of generic manufacturer has decreased. And um, what I've listed here is just a map of Germany with the two places where these two things have taken place. So on the left is Düsseldorf and a bit further up north is Hamburg. And this is develop, developing case law and we will see what happens um, next. And I think with that, I'm sort of done. Thank you very much. <laughs>